Perhaps but that's going to work. Is that working? You've got Emma there. Oh, Emma. So hang on. Right, you go on live. I don't know whether we are live yet. Oh, we're not We're not still in the same group, are we? Yeah, yeah ask David Lee. Talk to David Lee. David Lee, can you see it? Are we going? Yeah. Okay, we're going. <laughs> Good. Sorry. sorry it's taken so long to get here. Uh, but at last we've managed it. I don't know what quite went wrong with the. I think the house went went down or something. Um, not surprising, I suppose, at the moment. Um, oh, this is John Butt here, speaking from Helensburgh, uh, just north of Glasgow, northwest of Glasgow. I've lived here 19 years, um, and it's a wonderful place to be quarantined in because it, you know, the outlook is very nice. Um, this part, the houses are fairly far apart, so it's quite easy to get out and take the dog for a walk. Um, we're just below um, at Charles Rennie McIntosh's Hill House, so it's, it's a good part of the world to be. Um, I've only got a few minutes left really now because um, we, we are meant to go out and clap the National Health Service very deservedly so at uh, eight o'clock. But I'll try and answer some of the questions that have come through already uh first one is from vivian in um well i don't know whether she's from bristol but she said she saw a semi-staged messiah at bristol old vic and uh would we consider doing a semi-staged messiah this is an interesting question because um messiah is obviously a very dramatic work with a with a wonderful sort of um direction in it and a, and a sort of real sense of of drama uh albeit one that's spread out of the whole of christian history um so um, it's actually not doesn't have that much in the sense of actual narrative. Um, bits of bits of the Gospels are there, but most of it is actually Old Testament text. So it's not like an opera in the way that most of Handel's oratorios are. But yes, it is true that some bits of it could be dramatized quite nicely. My preference, I suppose, for it might actually be to use dance and movement, um, perhaps. I mean, there are many things you could do to Messiah um, and many ways in which you could sort of realize that a dramatic line, uh, but it's a bit more complicated than most pieces of its kind. So it's sort of worth thinking about. So we'll come back to that one. Um, the other question I had near the top of my list is, uh, what's my favourite temperament and why? Uh, this is an interesting, uh, slightly esoteric question, and this uh, relates to how generally keyboard instruments and corded instruments are tuned. Um, obviously, modern keyboard instruments tend to be an equal temperament by which every semitone is exactly the same distance apart or the same proportion of distance um, apart, which means that you can play in all keys equally well and each key um, has the same <clears throat> intervallic content. Um, but temperaments are very useful in keyboard instruments when you're talking about earlier music when the tonal system was quite new and certain chords and certain keys uh, were more pungent than others. Uh, so obviously, for earlier music, music that, that sort of relates to the late Renaissance polyphony style of the late 17th, 16th century and early 17th century, um, this hugely benefits from what's sometimes called mean tone temperament, particularly the quarter comma version, which is where the unevenness in tuning is spread in a certain way so that you have some very good fifths, um, but particularly really lovely thirds. It's a very... Um, uh, sonorous sort of temperament. So that's very good for that period. And most recordings of organs and harpsichords from the late 16th and early 17th, and indeed to the late 17th century, are in that style. Um, and it also brings out chromaticism incredibly well. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work if you're going to play in more foreign keys. And in Bach and Handel's time, there are many other temperaments. I suppose my favourites there are the Barnes Bach version, which is very good for something like the Matthew Passion. Uh, but also historical temperaments like Werkmeister. I won't say much more about temperament because in fact it's relevant mainly for keyboard instruments and singers and players, although they will take note of how a keyboard instrument is tuned, will also make their own tunings usually based on just intonation, perfect thirds, perfect fifths and so on. Um, so it's a sort of slightly esoteric issue, but it's an interesting one by which one has perfection with certain chords uh, and less perfection with others, while modern forms of tuning tend to go for equal imperfection across the board, uh, which is lovely if you've got music that modulates uh, a huge amount. Uh, my next question, which is my favourite Bach passion, St John or St Matthew, and why? This is from um, Future Talent. Uh, 
a very interesting question. I think that the answer to this lies in the fact that, that, that I think Bach has very well realised the different implications of the two basic narratives here, the John narrative and the Matthew narrative. Um, the Matthew narrative is very sort of human orientated. It's orientated to the personalities involved in the story, while the John passage is more orientated towards the sort of cosmic future to which the Christian religion is meant to point. Um, so I think uh, it really depends which version you're uh, going for um, in that story, the way you like that story. Um, so that's, I think, um, the answer there that, is that they are different pieces. They're not, they're not really in competition with one another in any way because they do very different jobs. Uh, in some respects, the Matt John Passion is more brutal, uh, but it's also more striking and dramatic in certain respects, while the Matthew Passion is more detailed, more emotional, uh, and perhaps more in keeping with sort of the sort of 18th century humanistic view of Jesus and uh, the perfect human being. So that's an interesting question. But but as I say, I won't I won't be drawn from one to the other because I think they do different jobs. Um, enough of passions. What about Handel Samson? Uh, this is quite an interesting thing. What made us want to record it? Um, and do we think a work this long can still be compelling for today's audiences in live performances? Well, um, the maximum length of this in live performance is around three, three hours, 20 to three hours, 30 if, you, if you're fairly leisurely. Um, and of course, that's not that different from many opera performances. So from that point of view, it's not a question of modern audiences not being used to um, this sort of um, thing, this sort of length. I suppose the question is the stasis of, or the comparative stasis of the drama in which not much happens. Um, and the reason that not much happens, particularly in the full version that we've performed and recorded, uh, <clears throat> is because it's meant to sort of conform to the unity of time. In other words, it takes the exact time or something close to the exact time of the original event. Also unity of action. So you can't <clears throat> move from one scene to another. So a lot, a lot of the real action, the, the, the pulling down of the building, for instance, happens off stage. So even though it's perfect in a certain sense as a drama in terms of Aristotelian unities. It's um, quite static from our point of view. Uh, so where lies the action? And of course, the action lies in the music, um, the orchestral parts in particular, and the different characters, particularly in the in the full version that we did with, with um, some seven soloists, seven or eight soloists. Um, so uh, it is a challenge, I think I have to say that. It really is a challenge to do this piece because it is a very long piece, but it was well appreciated in Handel's own time and indeed well into the 19th century and 20th century. So I, I think it's a question both of the audience getting used to the pacing of it, but also us as performers trying to find ways of making it work. Uh, and it certainly does have a wonderful drama to it, but it's a drama that one hears in the music rather than in um, actual events as such. And, and in the music, one hears character development and, and, and so on. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real challenge, but I think it's one that's worth attempting and worth uh, trying. And indeed, uh, most audiences we've done it for, uh, well, I'm sure they've complained, but not so much to me so far. So uh, I hope um, it's, it's worthwhile. And we, we've got probably a few more ideas of doing that in, in years to come. So there we are. That was Samson, uh, which I hope you, those of you who have heard the recording enjoy, um, particularly with the alternative versions that you can hear. It is the longest possible version. So if you still find it um, a little bit too much, then just cut out the movements you don't like. Uh, it'll still work uh, after a fashion. Right. The next question is about The Last Resort, the concert series we did last year, which uh, related to the auditions for the post of Cantor in 1722 at Leipzig, 1722, 1723, um, where we played the three major composers who offered the job, Telemann, uh, Christoph Graupner, and Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach was the third choice uh, within this lineup. The other two turned it down. Um, and it's quite interesting that quite a lot of the audiences did actually prefer some of the other pieces, particularly the Graupner Magnificat, which is a, a noisy and boisterous affair, but with, not without expression and detailed subtlety. Um, the two pieces that Bach did, on the other hand, 
are quite detailed and quite understated. They, they don't really make an, a lot of noise, but they are extremely subtle pieces. So, I mean, if one's looking at the sort of history of Western composition, it's absolutely clear that the Bach piece is the strongest within the traditions um, of valuation that developed after Bach's death. In Bach's time, though, who would have been the best person? Well, um, probably Telemann, actually, Telemann, because he, he was a very socially orientated person. He had a great sense of responsibility to the community, to music education and so on. Uh, he was a great mover and shaker, in other words, and wrote some excellent music as well as some, um, well, uh, less excellent music, but it's never less than pretty good, um, sometimes excellent. Um, so I think Telemann would have been the best person for that particular job uh, were I in charge of the committee. Uh, not the best composer, but they weren't looking for a composer, so <laughs> we tend to judge things by our later standards. Um, very interesting question, though, and um, I, I really enjoyed doing that project. It, it, it sort of brought out issues, like I've just been trying to discuss, um, that uh, we wouldn't otherwise have thought about. I, you know, I'd thought about them sort of abstractly, but not actually heard them in process like that. Um, Hearing, uh, the next question is about Monteverdi Vespers, hearing the John Passion in liturgical context. Why did we record the Monteverdi Vespers uh, on its own without any extra bits? Um, Andrew Parrott famously added um, some of the, uh, the chant and so on, and other, other performers have done this too. Um, well, this is a very interesting question, of course, and I suppose part of my mission is actually to defamiliarize certain aspects of music in terms of our current preconceptions. So in other words, to trying to hear what the Bach passions are like within the service in which they took place. But in the case of the Monteverdi Vespers, the 1610 Monteverdi Vespers, there's no actual evidence that they were ever performed. Um, and indeed, I think they were probably put together uh, as a way of actually sort of showing off the composer's talents at that time around 1610. Um, and therefore, actually, I, I think he did assume that they were a sort of work uh, in a way um, uh, a, a, in, in a sort of modern sense of the work. And uh, in fact, I've written an article in the Journal of the World Musical Association, uh, which if you're really interested, you can, you can look at, which makes this claim that the Monteverdi Vespers was, in fact, um, although it might have included much music that was used liturgically or could have been used liturgically, it's actually about Vespers. It's about church music. It's about um, how we sit and behave and uh, in here in time within a church service. So it's about us uh, hearing as much as it's about uh, people chanting the liturgy. So from that point of view, I think it's a very exceptional piece a uh, hugely exceptional piece, and therefore I do exactly the opposite of what other people have done. Instead of trying to put it back into a liturgical context, which it might never have been part of, I'm trying to uh, guess how Monteverdi conceived of it as a piece about Vespers, uh, about a, a type of service uh, where one hears people from different angles at different times uh, and has odd uh, movements. So that, I think that's um, that's an interesting issue. Um, I have a few more questions coming up um, right now, um, and uh, some are actually quite interesting ones here. I will try and answer these uh, just in a few minutes after eight o'clock because I'm sure you, like me, will want to cheer the NHS uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, so I'll give you a moment now to do that. I'll leave the computer on uh, and come back just for a few minutes uh, after eight, at about uh, four minutes past eight, um, just to answer the final questions I have on the list, um, many of which seem to uh, revolve around food, but they do say that food and music go together quite well, and in my case, sometimes a bit too well. Um, so I'll see you uh, soon.
Okay. 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 All right, I'm back. I'm back. If you're still there, um, this is still John Butt, I think. Um, I've got a few questions left, and I'm going to just go through um, a few of them now. Um, one quite interesting one here is about uh, composing and performing new music, of which I've done quite a lot. Uh, but whether it can be done in historical styles, uh, what's the idea of commissioning new pieces with specific historical styles, um, and, uh, and so on? Uh, and also the question of improvising in, in historical styles. Well, certainly improvising in historical styles, I think, is an excellent thing to do. And many people do this very, very well, better than I do generally, actually. So I wouldn't do it much myself, but uh, I do sort of practice a little bit at home just to keep my ear and um, insights going. Um, regarding actually composing pieces and, and performing pieces in historical styles that are newly composed, it's not something that interests me, to be honest, although Referring to early styles is hugely interesting. Um, in other words, taking the style of Monteverdi, Purcell, Bach, or whatever, and 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 somehow bending it yeah, and and inflecting it in the present. I think that is very interesting. And um, um, in fact, we're, we've got the Errol and Wallen Commission next year at the Barbican, based around uh, Purcell's opera, where we'll hear the whole of Dido and Aeneas and new music written in a different time zone around that. So uh, that's the sort of thing that really interests me. I'm not so interested in um, actually replicating old styles, but some people do like doing that, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, just go ahead and do it. Um, not something um, I, I would do myself, to be honest. Right, a few more questions now coming in. Um, What's my favorite restaurant? That's an interesting one from Victor Dumbarton. Um, my favorite restaurant, well, the one I really love going to when I'm in Glasgow, which is where my day job is, is still the ubiquitous chip, um, even though it's been there for so long and I've been going to it for so long and there are plenty of alternatives now, but it's just sort of become our house restaurant really at the university and I, lo I love going there and, it, and it's always reliable and sometimes absolutely brilliant. Uh, we do have a fantastic restaurant in Helensburg now, of course, that is AA winner of the year, the Sugar Boat. Absolutely fantastic food there. Um, unfortunately closed right now, but um, where isn't? Um, so I recommend that uh, when you go there. Um, now, what's the next one? Would I rather spend a month in quarantine with James McMillan or David Lee, who's our head of artistic planning? This is a hugely interesting question. Um, both of these men are interesting, intense and uh, Obsessive, I suppose one could say. So I'd, I'd imagine they'd both be unbearable in a certain sense. Uh, I know David Lee better than I know James Macmillan. Both hugely interesting. So I think it depends on the sh on the shape and format of the house, really. Um, do I have to actually be in the sa same room all the time? Um, James Macmillan is is obviously somebody who's intense in terms of um, thought processes in in relation to music, um, religion, and thought. Um, and, and sort of the philosophy of thought. Well, David, David Lee is, is a sort of genius in a way that he has an incredible range of interests, um, some of which appear simultaneously, which can be very confusing. Um, but really, uh, he, he was a postgraduate student of mine for several years, but I probably learnt just as much from him as he from me. So um, uh, so both, both very interesting. I think we'd have to look at the architecture though before I came up with an actual uh, answer. Uh, the next question is deep fried Mars bars, yes or no? Well, unfortunately, because I am sort of marginal for type 2 diabetes, I, it has to be no. Um, having said that, though, Sally, my wife, has actually done a tempura batter version of it in the past, and that was absolutely delicious. I must say, a sort of Japanese version of deep fried Mars bar. Uh, I quite like Rocket, actually, deep fried as well. That works very well already. Um, what piece of music would you like the chance to direct that you haven't done already? Well, ah, there's so much it could be. Uh, who, who, who would name it? I mean, uh, Bruckner is always said to be my favourite composer, and I think it might be true that he is in a way. So one of the symphonies, and particularly number five, is the one I'd, I'd love to do at some point. I also like Debussy too, um, which needs a lot of work uh, to, to, to get to get the, the flow and the detail uh but fantastic well yeah anything really i'm I'm up for most things and in, in fact conducting really bad things or not bad things or things i don't like is sometimes just as much a challenge as conducting things i do like 
uh, because you have to really work at it. So that's good. Um, more questions coming my way now. I've got a whole pile of them here. Um, uh, what would be my desert island disc and why? Uh, this presumably would be my one choice of music um, from the, the collection of nine records. Uh, difficult to say, really. Uh, it'd be possibly Bach, Debussy, well, and or um, Bruckner. Could be Mozart, could be Beethoven. Who knows? Uh, I don't know, really. I suppose it needs to be a piece that takes a lot of listening and over and over and over and again listening. So uh, perhaps one of the longest Beethoven quartets. Um, Matthew Passion, perhaps. Um, well, sometimes I find that a bit much from its sort of emotional overload. Um, Mm, well Temple Clavier, uh, Bruckner's eighth or seventh or sixth or fifth. I don't know. Um, good. Well, I can't think. I, that, uh, I'll have to. I have to think of that one again at some point. Uh, how to interpret Baroque piano music as score because it lacks information. This is a very interesting question and one that, in fact, Schumann addressed and many other people addressed in the 19th century that Schumann felt that adding markings to Bach's music um, uh, actually stemmed the flow of artistic freedom uh, that he believed that one should have as a result. So in, in a certain sense, piano music of Bach um, without, without any markings or with very few markings does actually allow you a lot of leeway. Uh, and it was people like Czerny who for pedagogic reasons, uh, put in a huge amount of marking and huge amount of direction. So uh, I think that Schumann's idea of freedom of interpretation, of being free from other people's ideas and following what you believe the music to say and how to do it is possibly the best way of doing it because that might well lead to many different forms of interpretation rather than a single one. Um, now, what else do I have a question from somebody here? Uh, my favourite animal from somebody called Boris. I don't believe that one uh, as a name for a start. Favourite animal and why? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I've always traditionally been a cat person, although we now only have a dog. So I'm a dog and a cat person for different reasons. Um, but that's still not the favourite animal. Um, I don't know. I suppose I like fast animals, I must say. Jaguars, cheetahs, and our dog is is sort of got a lot of greyhound in him, and and a bit saluki too, actually. So fast dogs, I think, are good. Um, horses are good as long as you're not too close to them, because they're huge, great big affairs uh, when they're going fast. Um, but yeah, dogs, fast dogs, fast cats, I suppose, is what I like, and anything from that family is fine. Um, I did have one other serious question. Um, have I answered that one? Oh, no, that was the one about modern composition. So I think I've actually covered pretty well everything, except for the question of, where is it now? Um, what temperature should champagne be served at? Um, this is an interesting question, and I think it, it really is a question of how good the champagne is. If it's, if it's not particularly good, or if it isn't champagne, then as cold as possible. Uh, if it is quite good, then you, you have to sort of wait until you can find the flavour. Uh, that's what I would say, but I'm not an expert on wine of any kind. I just, I'm, I'm more um, a user uh, than a, a connoisseur, I have to say. Um, is this one more question or not coming my way? Uh, Favourite whiskey? Ah, that is an excellent question. Uh, we have the dog brought this, and you can just see the dog there. If you're interested, that's the one that's a Saluki and a Greyhound in one called Max. Are you going to look at the camera, Max? No? Okay. What if I get you a treat? I'll get the dog a treat. I think that'll help. Um, there we go. That's a treat. There we go. He's going to eat it. There we go. Good. Um, so my final question of the day, my favourite whiskey. Um, again, this is actually a little bit like music. What's my favourite composer? What's my favourite piece of music? Um, it's, it doesn't boil down to a single answer, I think. Uh, it depends what mood you're in. When I was younger, like many people, when they first approach whiskey, they tend to go for the, the smoky ones um, because they're the most sort of exotic and, and, and inspiring in a way. Uh, I now only like smoky whis whiskies if they're quite old, 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and virtually any of them are good from that point of view, uh, particularly Ardbeg, Lagavulin and so on. Um, Speyside whiskies I've come to appreciate a lot more. Um, and really any of those work. Um, Springbank, I think, is a wonderful um, balance between um, mainland and island whiskies. And I think a Springbank perhaps has to take the 
take the take the prize. Um, Highland Park's always good too. They're all good actually. Uh, my only disappointment about whiskey at the moment is the fact that so many distilleries and makers of whiskey are um, uh, multiplying the number of things they do. So they you you have people who do who used to be very straight whiskies now doing um uh, people do straight whiskies now doing smoky ones people doing smoky ones straighter ones and we were sort of losing the differences i think between the regions a little bit but apart from that uh they're all good uh older the better on the whole although once you get to 30 years i find they start to go off uh one final question is any netflix suggestions for quarantine i don't really understand netflix to be honest uh so i'm not really sure uh, what's available, what isn't available. I mean, obviously, there are all these things like Killing Eve, which are really worth watching, if you like that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I tend to be a classic film buff, so I, I would look at filmmakers who are keen on music, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Bergman, um, Hein uh, Hanukkah, um, Alfred Hitchcock, I work on quite a lot, um, Kubrick and so on. So I think any any filmmaker who had an interest or still has an interest in music is worth looking at uh, because quite often the rhythms of music and the insights that music gives you uh, actually influence the way the film is put together. Uh, but whether you get those on Netflix, I'm not sure. So I can't, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question as well as I'd hoped. Uh, but anyway, uh, not that I've only just got it. So actually I didn't hope at all. I just answered it. Um, I think that's me done. So uh, thank you all for listening today. I hope it's been of some entertainment, if not anything else. No, it's certainly not edifying. Uh, and you never know, I might be back again at some point. So uh, I hope you enjoy uh, as you can, whatever quarantine you're in. Some people it's going to be good for, some people... Had... Oh, one more question, quickly, quickly. One more question. What recording projects are you working on? Um, well, we're, we've actually got several ideas in the uh, balance. It's a question really of opportunity, and particularly now. Um, I've always wanted to do the Bach Suite, the, the ones that we did at the Proms last year. Um, although we can't, I can't think of a particular angle on those yet to make them sort of different from anyone else but i think it'd be lovely to do them um there's a new uh, edition of uh, the mozart c minor mass which i'd like uh, to do very much at some point uh, and there's several bark projects that relate to where we might have been exactly 300 years ago in leipzig so uh there are quite a few little projects along those lines but as i say at the moment we're we're we're, we're working on what's possible with the resources, time, and uh, circumstances in which we find ourselves. Um, so this is a space that could indeed uh, continue to be watched. Um, I think that's almost uh, more than enough now. So uh, I hope to hear a bit more from some of you soon and uh, hope everything goes as well as it can.